Just look at the person next to you. How smart do they look? Just tell them you're smarter than me. Just lie. Lie to someone if you must. <laughs> lie to someone. Just tell them. You're smarter than me. You look much smarter than I do. So, we want to have a conversation uh, today. Uh, and I've called it the power of storytelling. But uh, we want to have a conversation today, as you've heard about uh, just some important cultural conversations about sexuality and about the LGBT conversation. And, uh, and But I want to ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? Come on, people, you have to talk to me. Can I ask you a question? Okay, I have a question that I need you to ask someone next to you, okay? So whether you're in twos or threes, just ask someone. Make sure no one is left out. Ask someone this question. What's the worst fashion statement you've ever made? What's the worst fashion statement? What's the thing that you wore once and you look back today and you think to, my, you think to yourself, oh, good Lord, I would never be caught dead wearing that. Can you think of anything? Please turn to someone next to you and just ask them that question really quickly. Make sure no one is left out. Just ask someone, what's something that you wore once you thought this was very cool, but today you would not be caught dead? Maybe it's an outfit, maybe it's shoes. Can you think of anything? Or are you wearing it now? Are you wearing it now? Is that why you're not saying anything? Is this it? <laughs> I want to tell you, I want to tell you about one of my fashion statements. So, growing up here in Sitam, Sitam was a very cool group of guys. It's like a cool group of guys. It was a very cool group of, of guys when I grew up in the, in the teens and youth church here. And uh, people were really into how they look and what they wear and whatnot. And, you know, being, being a teen and being in that stage, I was like, hey, even me, I'm going to flow with this thing. So I went to, I remember going to uh, an exhibition, a store in town. Uh, I got a little bit of money and I went and bought some clothes. And I went and bought those clothes and I knew I'm coming to youth church. That's the first place I'm going to wear those clothes. So I went and there, there were labels, there were, there were clothing labels back then that, I don't know if they still exist. But there was a label, I don't know if this is a pretty old label, you know, a label called FUBU. You know FUBU? FUBU was an old label, an American label for us by us. It was a super, super cool label. Now, I found a top. I found a really nice top written FUBU. Kind of looks like, like the blue one on this side. And I was like, my guy, I'm going to be the envy of everyone when I come to church wearing that. I bought it on Saturday, like at 6 p.m. And Sunday by 8 a.m., I was here wearing my FUBU top. And I came, he was here, and I came, we were having a youth church, it was downstairs. And I came in, and there's a lady called Rehab, I'll never forget this. Rehab, she walks up to me and she just bursts out laughing. First thing, she looks at me and she just bursts out laughing. Like, you know, you know what laughing, you know that genuine laugh that comes from here? The one for tears rolling down your face. She has that genuine laughter. And I'm, I'm like, what? Is it me? It can't be me because I know I'm really looking very, I'm looking cool. Thank you very much. I'm looking very cool. Do you know she pointed out to me that my top was not fubu? It was fufu. <laughs> Do you know that feeling for you just want the ground to open? You just go inside and you die. I was like, good Lord. And you know, at that age, that was like the most important. My image was the most important thing to me. So there I was wearing a fufu top. I didn't realize it. But I came to realize, realize something about the fashion world. And you know, in the fashion world, the fashion world is a great indicator that we don't make decisions for ourselves. You know that? The fashion world is such a good indicator that there is someone at FUBU who has created something and created demand for it and said, you know, you will look good in this, buy this. And you think, hey, actually, that's not bad. Decisions are made for us and we don't realize it every single day. And they are made in every area of life. You know, whether, whether you, you, you like Apple products, anyone here like Apple products? Whether you like Apple, receive it in Jesus' name. What's the, what's the matter? Receive it in Jesus' name. Say, I receive. <laughs> whether you like Apple products, any Arsenal guys here? Any Arsenal? Arsenal? Okay. You know, it's interesting. I find it so interesting. I'm also an Arsenal, uh, I'm an Arsenal sympathizer. That's what I am. I'm, 
I'm a sympathizer. That's what, pole, pole, I'm a sympathizer. But I'm just like, who told you to, and I don't, you know, I, this could be any club I pick. Who told you to support Arsenal? Who told you? You know, you, you, you think about it. Eh? You grow up seeing success. And you grow up, people have already made the choice that this is our club. And the decision, in a sense, has been made for you. Let me move on from that one. I'm seeing some Arsenal guys are getting injured. Let me just move on from that one. But my point here is, even with big brands, the reality is that decisions, marketing decisions, are made for us. When I was in campus, one of the things that I studied was uh, marketing. It's one of the things that I studied, marketing and e-commerce. It's my first degree. And in marketing, there's a mantra in marketing about the customer. Anyone know what, what that mantra is? What we say about the customer? What do you say in marketing about the customer? The customer? The cus did someone say the customer is gay? I don't know. <laughs> or key. Oh, sorry. Hey. I'm like, I know it's LGBT. The customer is always right. In every marketing class that you go to, we are taught that the customer is supreme. The customer is always right. And then in one of my very last lectures when I was doing, when I was in university, it was uh, an international marketing lecture. I'll never forget it. Our lecturer walked in. He said, take out a pen and paper. Write something. And this thing I'm going to tell you is going to be the most important thing you're going to learn in your four years of being in this institution as marketers. So, well, and he said, this thing I'm going to tell you is going to be so important you want to remember it. And so there we were. We took out our pens and our papers and we wrote it down. And he told us, I'm going to change that mantra for you. The customer is not always right. This is a true story. He told us, the customer is an idiot. You know, we dropped our pens. We were like, this, this is blasphemy. We don't know what this is. And this is what he meant. This is actually his words. He said, when you're a marketer, the customer is an idiot. You're the one who tells the customer what they want. You're the one who tells them uh, which products they enjoy. You're the one who tells them what to buy, what not to buy. Have you ever owned something and then you found somebody else owns something better and all of a sudden you don't like yours anymore? That's the work of marketing. It's there, you're there with your Infinix 100 and uh, the person next to you comes up and they have an iPhone what? Guys, receive, receive, I told you. And all of, that's the work of marketers. Let me tell you, the smartest or some of the smartest people in the world what their job is, is to create what's called demand. It's to create demand. It's if I can create demand, if I can get a product, and I say to myself, the people at Sitam need this, and I can convince you, most of them are the smartest people in the world. But are, and, and not even higher from them are people who are able to create what are called narratives or stories. And today we're going to talk about narratives. Uh, and we're going to talk about stories today. Because there are people in the world who create such clever narratives and such clever stories that whether you believe it or not, the moment you first heard it, by the time they're done with their narrative, you're going to be an advocate for it. You're going to be an ally for that narrative. I'm going to share with you three different people or three different organizations. The first two I'm going to do in passing, just to help with the, with the, with the story of narrative. But the third one we're going to spend a little bit more time on because that's what I know we came for today. So, narrative. Somebody say narrative. The power of narrative. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to tell you about these three really quickly. The first two I'm going to do quickly. We'll spend a bit more time on the third one in terms of narrative. Anyone know what MTV is? MTV is the first one. MTV is a uh, television channel that was started years and years ago. And you'll forgive me, I know this is a youth service, but because I want to tell you a narrative, I'm going to dig into history a little bit so that I can build on that narrative. Is that okay? So MTV was a station that was started in a channel. Uh, actually called MTV because it was music television. That was the MTV. And MTV was started in the, eight, in the early 80s, 1980s. And the whole idea of MTV was, you know, back then, there was hardly any music on television. There were no like music stations, there were no music channels. MTV was one of the very first, and it's been there for, for you know, 40 years or, or almost 40 years now. Now, MTV is interesting because 
of a number of reasons. First, so it started in the 80s. This was pre-Netflix, uh, pre-internet days. I know some of you can't imagine those days, pre-internet. But it's before pre-data and data bundles. They pioneered music programming in many ways. And you know the term VJs? We know DJs. You know VJs? Video DJs, video jockeys. They are the ones who pioneered this whole thing. They, and then they moved away as time went on from just doing music to doing other types of shows. So they did, you know, Pimp My Ride, MTV Cribs, Jersey Shore, and a whole other, you know, they got a whole litany of different shows. And their success gave birth to numerous other stations, BET, VH1, and a, and a number of other very successful stations. Now, here's what's interesting about MTV, as I just kind of wind up on that one. People sat in a room one day, MTV, is this, is this microphone okay? It's not okay, yeah? If you can just help me with that. So, the executives of MTV one day sat in a room together, and they created a... People, help me. They created a... There you go, narrative. They had a very powerful narrative. This is the early 80s. And they, they were asking themselves, what are we going to be known for? What are we going to be about? Who are we? What's our mission? And they came up with a very powerful mission statement. One of the most powerful I've ever heard. And they said, the mission of MTV is to own the youth of America. That's what they said. They want to own the youth of America. And these guys in a room, these guys sat in a room and they said this. You just think about this. Maybe five, six, maybe nine people sitting in a room and they said, our agenda, we are going to tell the youth of America what to wear. We are going to tell them what to like, what not to like, what music they will listen to. We will tell them what's cool and what's not. That's us. And MTV, it was so interesting because they became so successful through the use of media in this narrative. They became so successful that, you know, today we talk about millennials. You know how we talk about millennials and post-millennials and Generation X, Y, Z, and all of that? They were so successful that in the 80s, the generation of young guys who grew up and lived in the 80s became known as the... It's on the screen, people. MTV generation. That's how powerful these guys were. And what did they use? A narrative and media to be able to do that. No one has accomplished what MTV has done before then or since. You know, Facebook, as big as it is, Google, as big as it is, Apple, as big as it is, nobody has managed. They used a narrative and they used media. It's the power of the narrative and the power of media. Can I go to the second one? The second one is an organization called the CIA. You know the CIA? Stands for? Central Intelligence Agency, American Agency. It's a spy agency is really what, what these guys are. The key business of the CIA is what? It's hidden in the word. It's what? Intelligence. That's what their work is, to gather intelligence. It's really what they're about. Now, the CIA was struggling. They were struggling because they had what's called a perception crisis. When everybody thought about the CIA, they had negative thoughts towards them. They thought these guys are out to steal our privacy. These guys are starting wars in foreign countries behind our backs. This is some shadowy organization, and people hated the CIA. So the CIA sat in a room and they asked themselves, what do we do about this? They did a couple of things. The first thing is they began an operation called... Sorry, that's, that is my fault. They began an operation called Operation Mockingbird. You can Google this and, and look it up. Operation Mockingbird is very interesting. The CIA began a program to manipulate news media for propaganda purposes. What they did is that they began to recruit journalists and enter student organizations because what they wanted was, they wanted the story of the CIA to be told the way they would tell it themselves. Do you get that? So they entered the media with their narrative and they began to buy off journalists and people like that so that the stories that are written about the CIA reflect what they want. Whether it's the truth or not, doesn't matter. Narrative. Now the problem was that Operation Mockingbird was discovered by the public, by the American public. And there was uproar about it because you're saying, oh, all of a sudden we realize 
the media have been bought. They're not, they're not genuine. So the CIA had to have a, have a conversation and they shut down Operation Mockingbird, fired a few people, moved some things around. Then they went on to open the Office of Public Affairs. You know what that was? That was them just closing the office and opening it again with a different name. That's really what, they were just being clever about it. And they said, the people who influence public perception more than anybody else is the media. We must have our narrative in the media. So they went into the media, back into the media with a different type of program. In 1996, the CIA did something which was so awkward. They started an entertainment liaison office. Now, I don't know if you guys get the irony here. What's the key business of the CIA? Entertainment. What business do they have with entertainment? I always tell people it's like, it's like if you started a milk factory, right? So you own a milk factory and you had a, a division which, which makes bullets. Like there's no connection between the two. But there was a very clever connection that they made. And the idea, the CIA entered the media to begin to buy producers, buy directors, buy actors, so that their story can be told in the media the way they want it told. Now, this was the first big breakthrough of the CIA. Some of you may not, it's a pretty old movie, it's 1996. It's called Argo, it features Ben Affleck. This was a huge breakthrough for the CIA. They had invested in producers, in directors, in all of that, and they were able to partly fund this movie. This was the first movie to be shot partially within Langley, CIA headquarters in many, many years, almost 20 years, they were given access. The CIA pushed this movie, pushed this movie. It went on to win a couple of Oscars, and it was a slam dunk for the CIA. They were beginning to change the narrative. Are you following? Yeah. Are you with me? They began to change the narrative. They went on to look for people. There was, a, there was a, a popular author of novels back in the day called Tom Clancy. And he wrote a lot about the CIA. They began to influence his writing. And many of his movies, they turned into, into blockbusters. They began to use people like, like Baldwin and Ben Affleck and Harrison Ford. Very intentionally saying, create for us. Create for us the narrative that we want within Hollywood. You may not realize it, but right now, there is a ton of television shows and media things that talk about the CIA. And the whole idea is to make you feel like the CIA is your friend. The CIA, are, they're, they're, they're coming to save you. There are terrorists from Russia who are coming, and where are terrorists from? They're from Russia, they're from China, they are from where else? Hmm? The Middle East, the Arabs, and the CIA are your... Let me tell you something. That's not coincidental. That's a narrative that was formed in a room about who we want to be. There's a ton of these shows today if you think about it. Anyone know Narcos? Popular TV, TV show right now. It's about the CIA saving you from drugs. That's what it's about. You've got Person of Interest. You've got Homeland is another show that was shot in Langley at CIA headquarters, partly. Uh, you've got Quantico. You've got a whole, a whole heap of shows, but it's a narrative. And it's the power of the narrative. Because what they want is that they want you to think about them in a particular way. Menishika, you're following. Those are two. I want to tell you about the most powerful narrative I think I have ever heard. This is the most powerful narrative. This is one of the narratives I tell myself, I work in communications. Every communication student needs to sit down and try and understand what these guys have done. Because their narrative is so clever. And it's so intentional. And you'll see in a minute what it is that they have done. This is what was happening with the gay movement in the middle of the 1900s, 1950s you know, and 60s and thereabouts. The gay movement was on the outside of society. So this is a circle. They were over here on the edge. They were on the periphery of society. And they spent their time trying to figure out how do we influence government policy? How do we influence uh, you know, uh, you know, policy and things like that to change 
our, what people feel about us. So they'd go picketing. You know picketing, when you go with signs to uh, parliament and you're like, gay rights now, gay rights now. And you know they realized after doing this for years that it didn't work. And in 1969, as I told you, I'm going to give you a bit of history. They had a thing called the Stonewall Riots. The Stonewall Riots were a series of spontaneous, violent demonstrations by members of the gay community against a police raid uh, that happened in a place con called Stonewall in, in Manhattan, in New York. And right about this time, there was a change in the strategy of the LGBT movement. Now, they asked themselves the same question the CIA asked themselves. We suffer from poor perception. Who influences public perception? It's not rhetorical, I'm asking you. <laughs> the media. And they told themselves, this is the middle of the last century, that we must begin to invest heavily. And their strategy began to change. And I'll tell you something very interesting. In the medical field, in the field of psychiatry and psychology, there is a manual that comes out every 10 years. It's called, the, it's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's a big deal in the medical world. It's come out every 10 years, or every decade there was one that came out. And the medical world would look forward, this is a global document, they'd look forward to this document. In DSM, Two that came out in the 60s. DSM-2 said that uh, one of the psychiatric conditions that we must deal with in this decade is homosexuality. It's a psychiatric condition. This is the 60s, remember? This is about the time of the Stonewall riots. When the next DSM came out in 1973, it was very interesting because they had changed the word from homosexuality to sexual disturbance disorder. Sexual orientation disturbance. What does that mean? If I give you all the money in my wallet now and my, even my credit card and I told you explain to me, who would know what to say? Okay, I'm sure someone would figure it out. But they began to muddy the waters about that. The next DSM that came out in the 80s, homosexuality and this sexual disturbance, orientation disturbance had come out altogether. This is in about 20 years. And now, what, they are, what they've been fighting for now is that the word homosexuality is now replaced with homophobia. And that people who have homophobia now go for gay affirmative psychotherapy. In other words, let's, let's just change. Something is wrong with you. You're broken. You have a psychiatric condition. Just look at the person next to you and tell them. No, don't tell them. That. Don't tell them anything. I'm just kidding. But if you ask yourself, in such a short period of time, how are they able to change public perceptions? Media. The power of narrative. I'll give you some statistics quickly. The Center for Disease Control in the U.S., uh, this is 2016 data, not 2013. They had said that about 1.6% of the population was either gay or lesbian in the U.S. Now we use, I must admit, we use a lot of U.S. statistics, and the reason for that is because they have a lot of statistics. And uh, they kind of help. Another thing about the U.S. as well is that they shape culture. The West shape culture in many ways. It's a real shame that Kenya doesn't have the kind of cultural power that, say, Nigeria has, or Ethiopia, or South Africa. So what happens is that we are net importers of culture. We don't create pop culture. We import pop culture. And what happens there impacts us almost directly. You know, they say when the US catches a cold, the world sneezes. In culture, this is very true. So I will use, you'll see a lot of their illustrations here, but I think they're relevant for us. Anyway, they said that 1.6% of the population were, were gay or lesbian in 2016. Uh, that made up about six million people. Now, there are, at that time there were 15 million Asians in the US. That's how many times more? More than double, right? There were about the same number of American Jews and there were about the same number of American Indians. Why is it 
that in the media, all of a sudden, everywhere you're turning is about LGBT. Why is there an imbalance? If the media were really, you know, unbiased and fair, shouldn't they be telling us about Jews? Shouldn't they look at, look at different groups of people? But as we'll see, there is an agenda. This is what the this is what the LGBT movement did. I mind giving you some history. The LGBT movement began to work in Hollywood very aggressively. They began to be known as the gay mafia or the velvet mafia. The gay mafia or the velvet mafia, their job was to make sure that their content is in Hollywood because they realized that's the place that influences public opinion more than even music, more than anything else. And they began to invest heavily in writers, in producers, in executive producers, in directors, in actors, to make sure that their agenda and their narrative is pushed within the media. So they began, and you can Google the gay mafia or the velvet mafia. Uh, and interestingly for the church, there was even a thing called the lavender mafia where they began to buy off church leaders. So if you begin to see church leaders globally, important church leaders, just know that there, there's an agenda. There's an agenda, but I, I don't talk about that now. The first big breakthrough, some of you may know this show, some of you may not know this show. It's a pretty old show now. Anybody know a show called Will and Grace? This was the first big breakthrough of the gay mafia. It was the first time on television ever that we had seen a gay character. First time ever. And he was a lead character. Now, this was such a culturally important television show because it began to open the door for so much more. Joe, Joe Biden, who was a former US VP under Obama, uh, now he's running for president, he said, I think Will and Grace probably did more to educate the American public than anything anybody's ever done so far. It's very interesting. Now, uh, let me ask you another question. If you're watching a movie or you're watching television and you come across a Christian, a person who, who is a person of faith, describe them to me. What are some of their characteristics? If, you watch, if you're watching a Hollywood movie and there's a Christian person, describe them to me. Hmm? So they pray a lot. Uh-huh. Just shout out some words. Self-righteous. Self-righteous? Is that true? In Hollywood. Uh-huh. Give me a few more words. Judgmental. Uh-huh. Co condemning. Usually. Usually black. <laughs> been watching BET. That's what you've been watching. But my point is this. Is that... It's very interesting because in Hollywood, if you come across a Christian person, those things are normally true. They're normally boring, judgmental. You don't want to hang out with them. They're out of touch. All they do is carry a big Bible and pray. That's a narrative. Nothing is coincidental. And I'll tell you a bit later about that Hollywood narrative. Now, let me ask you a different question. If you come across a gay man in one of those shows, describe him to me. And now you guys have come alive, finally. You Christians. Uh, tell me about, just shout out some things you know. Interesting. He's kind. He's handsome. Uh -huh. I feel like I'm being described, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, I'm kidding. He's, he's a good cook. Smart, a good friend of the ladies. What do you say? Huh? I just had love you. I don't know what you said. Six pack. You guys are really describing me. Can you see it from the side? You can't see it. But it's interesting. That is a narrative. That's a gay mafia narrative. That was created for this is the person that we want you to see. 
It's not in any way coincidental. It's a very carefully crafted narrative. After Will and Grace, there have been many other shows that have come. Ellen, uh, there's been Modern Family. You know, no Modern Family. Some of these are slightly older shows. Then in terms of Hollywood blockbusters, they had two really big movies. These are a little bit older now, but these were just as culturally relevant for, for the gay conversation as Will and Grace was. Brokeback Mountain won three Oscars. Featured Heath Ledger, who was formerly Batman, and Anna, Anna, Anna Hathaway. It's called Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. Anna or Anne? Anne Hathaway. Something is not working there. Uh, but this was, this was a story of two men who were, I think, cowboys and found love. It was such an, such an important narrative for them because in the U.S., the people who have been most opposed to LGBT have been black people and people in the country, people who like country music, that, that demographic. It was a very important narrative for them. A couple of years later, they had this movie called uh, Milk that featured Sean Penn. You know Sean Penn? Sean Penn was from what? Taken. Is it Taken? Okay. I'm, I'm the one who knows these things. Won two Oscars. Was a very important movie. These are the movies that the Velvet Mafia come together and create intentionally. Why? Because there's a narrative. There's a narrative that they are pushing. These are all TV series. Hey, people are coming alive now. You guys, read your Bibles. What's the matter? But it's, it's, and I'll tell you something about each one of these series. Empire, which is ongoing, become a very popular series, very intentionally targeting who? Black people. Very intentionally. Very strong LGBT messaging in this. This show was created by a, a gentleman called Lee Daniels. If anybody has watched the movie The Butler, it's called Lee Daniels The Butler. It's the same guy. Lee Daniels is gay. And he has built this show to put in as much gay content as he can. If you've watched Empire, and I know none of you have, hallelujah. <laughs> Are you lying in God's house? But it's very, very intentional what it is. Lee Daniels very recently said his dream, and he began working on it, is to create a superhero, a gay superhero blockbuster, which is very clever. Because which are the biggest movies in Hollywood now? Superheroes. It's the Avengers. It's, what else is there? Superheroes. I didn't hear what you said. What did you say? Black Panther. His, his goal is to do that. Very interesting. Gronish. How many people know Gronish? How many people know somebody who knows Gronish? <laughs> ah, there are more hands are going up. Gronish is, is a, is a spin-off from a show called Blackish. Very interesting. And I'll tell you why this is interesting. Blackish is a popular uh, black comedy with very good themes. The older people who are in the room will remember things like the Cosby Show. Blackish is the 21st century Cosby Show. It's clean, good themes, viewing for the whole family. They have a spin off for one of the characters goes and makes their own show. That's a spin off. And this show is called Gronish. Gronish, however, has themes that Blackish does not have. It has a bisexual character. I think people are nodding their heads. And it has some LGBT messaging that Blackish did not have. In a moment, I'll tell you why that's very important. Anyone know the show Designated Survivor? Another very, very uh, interesting show. I, I used to watch this show at one time because I found it a very safe show to watch. Uh, with my wife at home. I found a very safe show. And then this show went off the air, or I, I don't know if it went off the air, I, I lost track of it and I kind of forgot about it. And then sometime this year, I thought to myself, well, let me take a look. Let me see how this thing is going. 
And the first thing I noticed as soon as I began watching it again is I noticed that the language had changed. The language has become more vulgar. Hallelujah, you're feeling me. I see that hand. I see that hand. The language had become more vulgar. It had become more gross. And all of a sudden, there's much more LGBT. There's a lot more. It's almost like day and night. And I realized, I began Googling. I was like, something has changed in this show because I couldn't watch it now. And I realized something. This show was on, initially was on like free-to-air TV. It was dumped by the network. They stopped making it. And then Netflix picked it up. And Netflix, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more. Netflix is so, let me tell you, today is one of the most culturally relevant uh, platforms for content for youth globally. Globally. Very important. Netflix have by far the strongest LGBT content of any network by a mile. And they took up this show and all of a sudden, this guy who's the president has a sister who's transgender or bisexual. I don't remember what he was. And I began to ask myself, what's going on? Same thing happened with this, which is a much more recent show. Anybody know Money Heist? Anybody know anybody? Let's move on. This is now a cultural phenomenon now, Money Heist. Uh, it's, a Spanish, it's a Spanish television show. And this Spanish television show was was kind of going on in Spain, I assume, or somewhere where they speak Spanish. And then, guess who saw it and liked it? Netflix. Netflix saw the show and liked it and said, can we redo this show? Can we take up this show, edit some of the scenes? And this show now has strong LGBT content. My, my point, I hope you're getting my point as we go along. One of the points I'm making here is that the media has a disproportionate reflection of LGBT. It's disproportionate. If you've seen any of these shows and I said to you, tell me which show has an American Indian or somebody who's disabled, which is another big group in the US, it's very disproportionate, but it's very intentional. There are three there are three kind of like a main broad, broadcast kind of systems, um, you know, um, around the world. Did I finish those ones? I did. There's what they call broadcast television, there's cable television, and there's streaming. Streaming is in red because it's a big one now. So I'll tell you the difference between them really quickly. Broadcast television, think of KTN, right? It's free to air, or think of NTV or, or K24, any of those. It's free to air... It's free to air television stations. Now, uh, broadcast television, there was a report done last year, and it said that in broadcast television in the year 2018, from January to December, there were 75 regular LGBT characters on broadcast television. Uh, and this is in the US. And um, that was up from 50, 50. Can you see how intentional they are? They even count. They even know how many we have. When I say regular, I don't mean someone who appears on a show and, and, and takes off. I mean someone who's there in every episode or regularly. Then you've got cable television. Now, cable television, think DSTV. And think of the, you know, Discovery Channel. Uh, what else is there on DSTV? History Channel. I see how boring I am. All the ones I know. Uh, uh, next? Next Jew. Nat Geo. I'm just as boring as me. Thank you very much. You're going to tell me a cool channel. But your MTVs and your BETs and all those are there. Now, that's what you call cable television. You need a set-top box for that. And then you've got streaming. Streaming, uh, now, on cable television, last year there were 120 regular LGBT characters throughout, throughout their programming. So you can see 75, 120, and 120 was up from 103 the previous year. Now, streaming, 
Now, streaming, you have to think about these Netflix. It's, it's online. You get onto your gadgets and you watch it online. So it's Netflix, it's Amazon, it's Hulu, it's people like that. Uh, we had Showmax recently. Anyone remember Showmax? Does it still, does it, is it still there? I don't know if it's still there. You could watch Showmax on your phone, couldn't you? Or uh, what's, what's the Kenyan one? View Sasa. Or View Sa Why are you laughing? It's the, it's the one. <laughs> we love your own, please. Eh? iTunes. We love you as your own. Now, the thing about uh, streaming, it's on online streaming. There were 128. This is interesting because streaming has the fewest platforms, but the highest number of LGBT characters, and growing at the fastest rate. Why this is, why this is important is there are a couple of distinctions. Streaming platforms have a far greater representation of LGBT. And streaming platforms, of, of the three platforms, are very interesting because they're the only platform that is global. It's the only platform that is global. That means anywhere you live, if you have a Netflix account, you log in and you watch your show. If you move to another country, you continue with your account, you log in and you watch your show. Netflix is becoming extremely, extremely popular globally, together with Amazon and Hulu and people like that who are streaming content now. A lot of their shows are the ones that are being bootlegged across the world. In Kenya, in different places, a lot of the Netflix shows are the ones that are being bootlegged. So the first thing is that streaming platforms have far greater LGBT representation than any other. And I'll tell you the difference between the two, the two and why that is. Broadcast television relies on advertisers. Streaming and cable relies on subscription. You get the difference? Now, it's, a, it's an important difference in terms of the content they churn because when you rely on advertisers, your advertisers are attaching their brand to your platform. And they are very concerned about what you have on your platform. But now when you start subscribing, there's, none, of that is, none of that is required. None of that is important to them. They, are, they, are at a, they have a lower risk of alienating advertisers. And as a result, they can put in much more. The other thing about broadcast as opposed to streaming is that broadcast is open to far more regulation from the government than streaming is. Why? Because it goes to the public. Subscription, you're the one who chose it yourself. So you watch what you choose. But if you're showing it to the public, the government comes in and says, hey, excuse me. I'll make a little note there, which is for free and is not part of this presentation. You know who's become the fall guy for regulation in Kenya? Dr. Ezekiel Mutua. He's become the fall guy. Because we know him for what word? Ban. Senor. And it's interesting, he's become the fall guy. I tell you, you have to travel to other jurisdictions and other places to see government regulation. Ours is nothing. We've lived in chaos for a long time. And finally, someone has stepped into that space and said, guys, we must regulate this space. And he's become the fall guy. In other jurisdictions, you know, here you could be, you could be in a jav, you could be in a mat. And the most vulgar thing will come on the screens or, or play. Isn't it true? You know, I could be walking with my son in the supermarket and on the, on the, you know, radio, whatever it is, through the speakers, anything could be blaring. You cannot try that in many other countries. You just cannot. It cannot work. There's a thing they call the watershed hours from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. I used to live in Australia years ago. And you know, it's such a secular country, they never allowed any Christian broadcast, any spiritual broadcasting in watershed hours. They were like, don't tell us about your religion. You can tell us at night when you want to stay up and watch or early in the morning you wake up and watch it yourself. But don't give it to everybody. It's so strict. Kenya lives in chaos. We are finally starting regulation. But that's another story for another day. Can I leave that one there? There's been an increased spend on streaming. Uh, you can see the figures there. Last year alone, Netflix spent $8 billion, $8 billion. 
Someone just tell someone else, eight billion dollars. Tell someone, just give me a quarter. Give me a tenth. And the streaming, streaming platforms are investing far greater than anyone else. Now, let me say, broadcast is investing more money because they are bigger. But streaming is small, but they're investing a huge amount. Uh, Netflix, eight billion. Amazon, Amazon, uh, 4.5 billion. Hulu, 2.5. Apple, 1 billion. Altogether, that's about 16 billion. That's about maybe 10% of Kenya's GDP. It's being spent by some of the smaller players in terms of the creation of content. And the creation of their content is very decidedly narrative-based. It's about creating a narrative. Here are some of the shows on Netflix. Uh, you know, Orange is the New Black is one of the very first shows they did. It's a couple of years couple of years old. Sex Education is a much newer show. Uh, very popular. You, Miha. Uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. RuPaul's Drag Race is about, uh, what are they called? Uh, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, transgenders. Uh, Queer Eye for the Street Gang. There's a ton of them. There was um, House of Cards. And there are many of these shows. And I could, I could go on with many more slides of the things that are happening. And remember what I said, Kenya is a net importer. That's what we are. We are net importer. You're like, Netflix, what do you have for me today bring? What, Amazon, what do you have for me today bring? But they are coming loaded. They are coming loaded with narratives. Did you know that Facebook now also has uh, what's called a video on demand platform called Facebook Watch? It's been there for about maybe a year, a year and a half. Facebook Watch already has strong Facebook, you know Facebook, then you're all on. You're not on Facebook? Oh, Instagram, sorry, excuse me. My bad. And Snapchat. But Facebook has its platform now called Facebook Watch. Two of the very first shows that it's done are strongly LGBT. There's a comedy called Strangers. The key character is a lesbian. Uh, there's Five Points, a second one, which is uh, uh, produced by Kerry Washington, who was in Scandal, which is another very strong LGBT show, and uh, that portrays both gay and lesbian characters. But what's interesting about this narrative is that this narrative has begun to seep down lower and lower every year. And now this narrative is beginning to impact kids. That kids' content now is coming with narrative built into it. I'm going to put up pictures on the screen. Look at this. Just look at how innocent these pictures look. Look at how nice and innocent and kiddy. We could be showing them to the kids downstairs just now. Steven Universe. Netflix. Featured recently the first same-sex wedding on children's television ever. See these sweet kids. Adventure Time is by Cartoon Network. And it featured a queer relationship between Princess Bubblegum. Can you hear that? Princess Bubblegum. <laughs> Princess Bubblegum and Marceline the Vampire Queen. Cartoon Network. Queer relationship, and it shows them, you know, kissing and whatnot. Can you imagine this, this one's kissing? Can you imagine that? Can you even picture it physically? But the messaging, narrative, the power of narrative is going younger and younger and younger. There's two more. A Disney Channel has these two. It's called the Loud House. You know it? Loud House. Loud House, in, 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 it features the, a bisexual teenager, Luna. Hey, good job. You want to come up here and help me? And she has a crush on both boys and girls. This is now kids. The narrative is going younger and younger. Disney has another one which I find quite dangerous. It's uh, Marvel Rising Secret Warriors. Do you know who owns Marvel? The Marvel franchise, the Avengers, and all of that? Who? Disney. Disney, like Netflix, have a very strong LGBT agenda. 
Those are the things we are going, we are flooding the cinemas to go watch. And the things now coming that we are subscribing for on Netflix and things like that and are now coming to our kids. I want to show you on the next slide another important thing about this narrative. And it's this. Is that the, gay, the Velvet Mafia, as they are known, have worked hard to increase representation of LGBT characters on television every single year for the past 10 or so years. You may not see the figures, but you can see the growth on this chart. The whole idea here is, and, and this, by the way, is tracked by a movement called GLAD, which is a gay rights uh, advocacy group for media. Very wise, they are very clever in their, from 2005 when they began, they had a slight drop, but from there it's been rising and rising and rising. Now, this is up to 2017, they say that, um, there was about 6.5% of all regular characters on television were LGBT in 2017. Now, as of 2018, 2019, uh, it's, it's risen the last bit here to 8.8, .8, about 9% of all characters. And they are saying by the end of the year, they want to be at 10%. What this means is this, is that on every row here, every row, there's one LGBT character in this, in this room. If I asked one person from every row to stand, in fact, let me do that. Let me ask one person from every row to stand on the end of the row. I'm not saying you're LGBT, relax, please. Eh? <laughs> I, just, I, want to see, I want you to see visually what I'm saying. Could I ask the, the guys on the end, the last person, here, the first person, just stand, don't worry. First person here, first person there, first person here, first, first person here. That's those ones can stay. Every row, one person stand. Every row. Make sure someone is standing every row. Just stand, please. I want a visual representation of what is going on. One person per row. Is every row represented? Take a look at that room. It's, are you seeing how significant it is? It's saying by the end of this year, one person on every row will be pushing an LGBT. Please, please have your seats. Thank you for. I hope you see. I hope you see what it is that I'm trying to say. I want to tell you why this is important. There's a phrase called social conditioning that I want to tell you about. This phrase was uh, talked about a lot by a neurologist, an Austrian neurologist, years ago called Sigmund Freud. And. He talks about social conditioning. And he says, social conditioning is the process of training individuals in a society to respond in a manner generally approved by the society or by certain peer groups within that society. Now, what he's saying here, in fact, let me break down socialization, a word that we may, may have heard, socialization and social conditioning. I'll tell you the difference. Socialization is an organic process. It happens naturally. So I'm Kikuyu. And Kikuyu, people say they like eating. Waru, may I eat pizza? What are you saying? Why are you? And people are being targeted here. But you say we like eating warus. Now, was I forced to eat warus? Okay, well, yes, I was actually. But it's because you see people eating warus, isn't it? So, you know, whatever, whatever, whichever part of Kenya you're from, a meal that you have, it's because your people eat it. And very organically and very naturally, you begin eating it and liking it as well. True? That's socialization. Social conditioning is different. Social conditioning is me intentionally rewarding you for certain behavior, punishing you for other behavior, maybe punishing is the wrong word, but applauding you, pushing you intentionally to go in a particular direction. You get it? It's very different from socialization. And the narrative of LGBT is social conditioning. That the more 
that's why this is very important. The more that you see, the more you begin to empathize. The more that you see, the more you begin to feel, this could be me, this could be my brother. The more, and as they increase represent, did you see what happened when people stood up, how many they were? You begin to see, ah, kumbe, it's, ah, kumbe, it's just, people just like us. That's the process of social conditioning that goes on with the, with the LGBT movement. Social conditioning. And it introduces a thing called the herd mentality. The herd mentality is, fact, let, me, let me just put that down for a bit. The herd mentality is this. This is iTunes, isn't it? We're all iTunes, we hang out together, we, we are close friends, we, are, you know, we, we chill together. We are, they're a family, the iTunes family. Only a few people said yes, others were like, hmm. <laughs> I don't know about that. So, but herd mentality is this. Herd mentality is when two people in the group who are influential begin to say, we should go to, where, where, do, where does iTunes hang out? Are you where? Magan Bean. Yes. They say we go to Magan Bean. Now, someone in iTunes went to Magan Bean, had a sandwich that had a caterpillar in it, and they ended up in hospital. Herd mentality and the herd instinct that that person is afraid to share their opinion because there's a vocal minority that is driving the group. Comprende? We understand that. It leads us to the herd mentality, where the opposition to the herd is as good as separation from the herd. And therefore, we anxiously avoid. In fact, it says, individuals in those circumstances are conditioned to partake in social norms of said group, even if they contradict one's moral code. This is the goal. I don't know if you're following with me. The goal, and I always say this, never confuse the vocal minority with the silent majority. Never confuse the vocal minority with the silent majority. In everything, the vocal minority sets the agenda for the silent majority, in most cases. And the vocal minority are vocal and they are clever about their narrative. So that people in the group, even though you don't like something, you don't like Magan Bean, even though you're personally opposed to LGBT, you now have no choice but to keep it to yourself. And this results in an inability for one to practice their own instinctual impulses. It means that me, therefore, I can't, I can't therefore say, I, I don't know, I don't agree, because the vocal minority has spoken. The gay mafia have developed this narrative, very pervasive narrative, and it has entered into the psyche of many people. It's still a vocal minority, but it's still driving the agenda for the silent majority. They've done this in music as well. I'm not going to spend as much time in music because I believe in our culture, film and television have been their strongest drivers of their agenda. But in music, you begin to see it and you begin to feel it as well in music. I'll put up a chart here uh, that's by Nielsen Research. Now, you may not see. Um, can you read? Can you read? I'll tell you what's on it if you can't see. Is they say that musicians are playing an important visible role globally as LGBT allies. And when they look at who all their allies are, they have different like little charts there. At the bottom is hashtags. So hashtags are important. They say that they drive, they drive some conversation. Uh, so, so, you know, recently in Kenya we had a hashtag, repeal, you don't know what the hashtag was? Repeal 162, the se a section of the constitution uh, that criminalizes homosexual conduct, homosexual acts rather. So hashtags play a part. Uh, they say, you know, banning governments and travel from countries 
you know that, do you remember when, when you know, pres, who was it, President Obama and President Kenyatta had a conversation about LGBT? And said, we don't agree with you, we're going to ban you from coming to our country. It does have some impact. Saying we won't allow you to come for our sporting events or we won't allow you to host your sporting events in our city or in our nation has some impact. Uh, <clears throat> they say, you know, for organizations that don't support LGBT, you cannot, your headquarters cannot be in our country, you must move somewhere else. That has some impact. You cannot film or make television or movies in our jurisdiction. It has some impact. At the top of that thing is when musicians protest. It's such an interesting thing in the 21st century that musicians have such power that when they protest against something, especially where LGBT is concerned, that's the one thing that drives the agenda more than anything else. Music. And they say that in LGBT in music is used for four key things. Now, there's four reasons, or four, four, key, four key drivers. The first is to share the LGBT struggle. The second is to promote gay pride. The third is a response to discrimination. And the fourth is music that's created by LGBT artists, whether it has their messaging or not. But these are the four key things to consider for music. I'll, I'll make this one quick because I know we've, we've talked quite a bit. I'll give you an example of each one of them. Some of the songs are more recent, some of them are a little bit older. Uh, some may know them, some may not, that's fine. Lady Gaga, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, influencer globally, has one of the biggest followings on digital media of anybody on the planet. Um, so, so I, I, I don't know if she's LGBT or not, but Born This Way became an LGBT anthem. And what she was doing was, she really was identifying with the struggle of the movement. Um, the others who promote gay pride, uh, Michael Moore and Ryan Lewis had a huge song called Same Love. When I say a huge song, I mean globally. This song won Grammys and whatnot, but it was a huge song globally. And the idea was promoting gay pride. There are others who are a response to discrimination. Big name artist, her name is Sia. I think she's Australian. Uh, she's part of the LGBT movement herself. But she did this big song called The Greatest. And the idea was it was a response to a nightclub shooting in Orlando at a gay nightclub. And she did this song to identify and to respond to the discrimination that they were suffering. And then music created by LGBT artists. Uh, it's an R&B guy, Grammy winning. So when I say Grammy winning, it's really saying that these guys have stature. And uh, Frank Ocean, um, you know, award winning artist. And in his music, he actually uses the term he when he refers to love. Um, unlike many other LGBT who will, will couch it. But he actually uses the term as he, as he does that. I want to close, my time is almost over. I want to close with just a few comments. I don't know if you're getting what my, my connection here is. My connection here is saying this. Narratives are created. They don't happen organically. They are created by someone for an agenda. More often than not, it's a vocal minority trying to herd us in a particular direction. And I think that's what happened brilliantly with the LGBT movement. They have created the narrative. Then they have gone into media, the place that influences, and they have pushed the narrative. But I want to close with a couple of comments and say this. There's a problem with that narrative. That narrative is broken in many ways. Because, you know, if I was selling you my car, and it was a second-hand car, if I was selling you my car, I would tell you all the good things about you, wouldn't I? I would. I'd tell you all it moves at this speed, it has this, it has that, it has the other. What would I not tell you? I was, in the, I was in the Mac last week and the week before. And the week before we had to change, I won't tell you any of that. That's a part of the broken narrative that's missing from this. I really liked this image. I saw it on social media recently. Have you seen it? I really liked that image. Oh, there's an apple there and a reflection of the apple. And it shows you the best part of the apple, the best side of the apple. 
But what it hides, and this is the problem with narratives, some of these popular narratives, they show you the glamour, but they hide the pain. And that's a, that's a problem with the narratives, even with LGBT. I'll close quickly. I don't know if anyone remembers this couple. This couple was from a couple of years, a few years ago. It was a Kenyan couple in the UK, and they wanted to get married, and they moved to the UK, they couldn't get married here. Anyone remember that couple? Uh, then this was some, some years back, Charles and Daniel Shege. Now, we made a big song and dance about it. People did, the media made a big song and dance about it. Do you know they didn't tell you? For one of them, it was their second marriage because their first marriage had fallen apart. What they, didn't, what they don't tell you also is that less than two years after we made a big song and dance about these people, they had an extremely messy divorce. No one tells you about that. That's left out of the narrative. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a minute. Any people who like rugby here? Any rugby fans? So you know the Rugby World Cup just started two days ago. Yeah? Um, this guy is called Gareth Thomas. Gareth Thomas is renowned in the rugby world. He was the captain of the Welsh rugby team, Wales. He captained a huge side called the British and Irish Lions that included England and Wales and Scotland and whatnot. Big name in the rugby world. In 2009, he came out as the first you know, major athlete within that's the sport and said, listen, I'm gay. And what did the world do with herd mentality? Congratulations. Fantastic. We are so grateful that you came out. September this year, he came out and he said, I'm HIV positive. No one tells you that story. And no one tells you the broken part of this narrative. I'll share with you a few things about the broken part of the narrative. And then I'll, then I'll close. The first thing here that no one tells you is that same-sex couples reported shorter relationship lengths than same-sex couples. No one tells you that. Let's celebrate, let's, let's go out, let's be gay, let's do this thing. No one tells you that those relationships, by and, la by and large, don't last or last much shorter. Nobody tells you that. I found this in psychology today. They say that gay marriage has a higher divorce rate than heterosexual marriage. Now, and to be fair to them, it's still early days in terms of gay marriage. And what they say is that many people who, who get into gay marriage get into gay, gay marriage because of the novelty of it. We've been dating for a while and finally we can get married. People don't think about things that heterosexual couples may think about. They don't think about family, going to see family or things like that. They don't think about, let me get premarital counseling. People rush in. So it's still early days and we'll see what happens in the next 10, 15 years with gay marriage. But currently, this is what the reality of it is. Divorce in gay marriage gets extremely messy. Nobody tells you that part of it. It gets messy because if you have kids, what do you do with them? How, how do you determine roles? How do you determine any of that? How do you determine the kids' well-being? Nobody thinks about that. I read an interesting article about Gareth Thomas, who I put up earlier. Nobody asks the question about what happens to his wife and family when he comes out as gay. That's a part of the apple nobody tells you about. No, nobody tells you what will be the impact on them. Now, I'll tell, give you a couple, just a couple more, then I'll close. According to the Office of National Statistics in the UK, in the UK lesbian couples have two and a half times higher likelihood of divorce than anybody else. Lesbian couples divorce, they break up more than anybody else. But we celebrate them walking down the aisle. That's what culture is pushing us into. But that's a part of the bitten apple that nobody is telling you. This is a, this is a very tragic one. That gay men, call them MSM, men who have sex with men, are two to three times more likely to have concurrent sexual partners than any other group globally. What that means is, what the statistics tell you is that infidelity is highest within that group of people, especially MSM. Nobody tells you that narrative. Now, this is the one that's scary. 
this statistic is from a couple of years ago, and it says gay men were 2% of the US population. This is 2013. But 2% accounted for 59% of new HIV infections and 62% of all cases of early syphilis. We celebrate, be you, do you. You know, there was a campaign in Kenya recently called Love is Human. I don't know if you saw it, there were billboards. Love is human, that's so cool, isn't it? Love is human, we're just humans. Let, let me be. Nobody tells you the downside and the broken part of this narrative. The CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control in the US, estimates that HIV and early syphilis rates among gay men are 40 times higher. 40 times higher than among those, among heterosexuals. If you're gay, you have 40 times more likely or at risk of HIV. Nobody tells you that narrative. That's a part of the broken, broken narrative. I want to close with just a passage of scripture. Uh, actually, I, I may just, uh, I may just uh, skip this. Uh, let me just do it quickly. Parable of the shrewd manager. I want, to, I want to close with this. It's one of the passages I really like. Luke 16 has a fantastic parable that Jesus has. And Jesus says, he's, he's, he gives this parable and he says, there's a guy who's about to be fired from his job, right? And he knows he's about to be fired. So what does he do? He goes to the people who owe his boss money. And he says, you owe the boss how many? A hundred. Make it fifty. He says, you owe the boss how many? Fifty. Make it twenty-five. You owe how many? Seventeen. Make it twelve. And when he gets fired, what happens? He's made friends. He's gotten, he's gotten like comrades. It's a very interesting parable if you look at Luke, Luke 16. And Jesus commends him. It's so confusing. But Jesus is not commending him for being a crook. Jesus is commending him because he says, you are shrewd. And in fact, the passage says, and it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. It's such, this is Jesus talking 2,000 years ago that the world is smarter than us at creating narrative. They are smarter than us. When we talk about the church and we talked about a Christian in Hollywood and what they look like, they are smarter than us. Do you know some of the biggest blockbusters of, the, of Hollywood many years ago were Christian movies? There's a movie called Ben-Hur. H-U-R. No, no, it's an old movie. That was a huge movie. There was uh, the Jesus film. That was a big, big movie back in the day. You know what happened? There was a Christian caucus that, had a, that owned a studio in Hollywood, a big studio, and they created Christian content. They closed that studio to do ministry. And they withdrew the Christian influence from Hollywood. And we have struggled to catch up ever since. What would Jesus say? Because the people of the world, they are more shrewd. They are cleverer. And somehow we, as a Christian community, must begin to ask ourselves, how, in fact, I wish I had time to take you to the social media statistics. We did some research of local churches, and we put together 20 of Kenya's uh, biggest churches and what their digital footprint was like. I wish I had time to take you through that. It was sad. We put together, including Sita, including together my church, Mavuno, and all 20 different churches, we put together all their Facebook uh, followers, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Do you know that for all of them, Akode had a bigger combined footprint than all of us combined? All of us. Churchill, Churchill's Facebook footprint was five times ours. No, Twitter, on Twitter. Was, he had 2.2 million followers on Twitter. It meant if every church, all those 20 churches today, told everyone who was following their pages, tweet this. And we all tweeted it, all of us. And Akode just said, don't go to church. She will reach more people than all of us combined. The people of the world. And it's a challenge. We must begin to engage in media because we have narratives. And you know which narrative we have? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We have a powerful narrative for the salvation of men, the souls of men and women. 
My last passage. Have I said last like five times? It's my last, last one. Is this. I love this. This one is now my challenge to you. As an individual, you as a parent, you as someone who has children. It's my challenge to everyone. It's a conversation between God and Job. And God says this to Job. He says, who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I told the sea, this far you may come and no further. This far, here is where your proud waves halt. And God, even in creation, sets boundaries. And he says, even the ocean, with its raging tons, millions of tons of water, you will never cross this line. This is the line that you will come to and you will never go beyond. I want to tell you this, that there is a strong, strong LGBT agenda. And as we think about media and our consumption of that media, where is your line? Where is your boundary? Where is the line that's saying this is not godly? This, it's interesting. We consume, as Christian people, the very media that is against our own narrative and against our own agenda. But we consume it wholeheartedly. We have no filters. We have no gate. Netflix has a new show. I want to go and see what season four is about. And let me, let me speak if you have kids in particular. You have to make sure you have that conversation for where is this boundary? Where is the place that we can go and we will not pass? That this is as far as we will go. Do we have our boundaries in place? And are they clear? I want to challenge your consumption of popular media. On social media, on the internet, on radio, on television, and on film. Are you a, are you a good salesperson for the kingdom? Are you representing the kingdom with everything that you have? Or are there places where the lines are not, they're, they're blurry? I really want to challenge you. Because in this, and this is my final, final comment. <laughs> yeah. In this world, you will either influence or be influenced. There is no neutral space. You will influence or you will, you will be influenced. 